and welcome, welcome to Bridge Community Church. We're so thankful to have you here this morning on this crisp fall Sunday. Uh, it's a blessing to be here. Thank you for those of you that are joining us here in person, and we still love all of our people who watch us online. We're thank thankful for you as well. Um, I've got a bunch of announcements today. Um, today, our youth, our Impact CT, they are actually going go-kart racing this afternoon starting at 1 o'clock. Uh, they're going to ship out. And I've learned about our youth is their life is way more fun than mine. They're going go-karting today. So if, if you are a teen or youth and you want to go to that event, um, be here at 1 o'clock and they're going to head out to go go-kart racing. Uh, there is a cost associated with that, so check in with Tune Day on that. Um, but have a fun time go-karting today. Um, there is a family worship night coming up soon. Our fall worship, worship night, sorry. And, and just to make a note, the phone number on there at the bottom to text is wrong. It should be 860841. I think it might say 891. I can't actually see it without my glasses right now. But it's uh, 860841 is the number to text. If you're going to join on that, uh, they would love for you to RSVP. Um, also coming up tomorrow, um, our trunk or treat. Uh, that was supposed to happen, I think, this past weekend, and it got rained out. So it's happening tomorrow night. So Monday night, tomorrow night is our trunk or treat. Uh, bring some kids for that. Or if you're planning to decorate a car, we'd love to have you do that with candy and things like that. That's tomorrow night. Our trunk or treat is happening tomorrow night. So a lot of things have changed uh, due to our, the weather recently. Trunk or treat tomorrow night. And today is a special day. Who knows what today is? Pastor Appreciation Sunday. Uh, who here is thankful for Pastor Todd? That, that is what I thought. And, and I as well, my family, were so thankful for Pastor Todd. So we are going to celebrate him today after the service. How do we celebrate here at the bridge? We got cake. You know, so right after the service, head down to the fellowship hall and don't tie up Todd. I know you like to do that. There's going to be plenty of opportunity. But through the service today... Think about encouraging words for Todd. Um, if you, if you want to jot him a note or send him a text or shake his hand, give him a hug, encourage him today for the pastor that he is. Because even we were talking about, I think in church recently, but I've been seeing it in my Bible reading about how the church says, you know, we are one body and many parts. And we all play a different role. And scripture talks about Jesus being the head of the church. And I just made up myself, I think Todd is our face. Because he is the one who, in seeking God, sets up the community and the culture that is Bridge, Bridge Community Church. Why this church feels so welcoming, why the bridge feels like home to so many of us, is what Todd has put into it. That he has sought after the Lord, and God has placed him here in this city of Bristol to love on us, to love our community, and run this church and lead this church. So again, yeah, let's give it up for Pastor Todd again. So definitely this morning, be praying for Todd and his family, and let's give him words of encouragement this afternoon. So pray with me. I'm going to pray, pray in for Pastor Todd and, and open up our service. So pray with me. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for Bridge Community Church. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us a place to call home where we worship you. Lord, church community is so essential in our walk with the Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that you have placed a leader over us in Pastor Todd to love on us, to guide us, uh, to, to share your word every Sunday morning and even throughout the week, Lord. Uh, we pray just blessing over Pastor Todd that he would feel, feel loved not only by you, his Father in heaven, Lord, but also by everyone that walks through these doors every Sunday morning that he would be encouraged, that he would be loved, that he would know that Bridge Community Church is for him and loves him, Lord. And we just pray that you would bless him on this Pastor Appreciation Sunday, Lord. Well, Lord, we thank you that we can come together and worship you. We have a place to love you and that you love us, Lord. So as we worship this morning, let's get our hearts and our minds focused on our true Father in heaven, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. One more round of applause for Pastor Todd.
gone through the support You would manifest yourself in us Yes Yes, I love you, Lord Oh, your mercy never fails me Oh, my This is what we do forever and ever. We will sing of your goodness, God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good.
So we praise you, Jesus. We praise only you, Lord. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who
Can we put that bridge on the screen? Because we were the beggars, but now we're royalty. Now we're Dear Jesus, we love you. We shout your praise, Lord. Give God a shout. Give God a shout. Amen. Dear God, thank you for your amazing grace. Thank you, Lord, for how good you are to us. Thank you that your goodness is always running after us. Thank you, God, that you are an amazing God. Thank you for your great love for us. Lord, as we started this time, we love the way you love us. We just love the way you love us. We pray that you just bless this time as we open up our hearts to receive more of your love and whisper back to you, God, we love you too. We love you too. We just love you, God. You could take it all away from us like you did to Job, and we'll still, if we have you, we'll have everything. You are everything to us, and nothing matters more. We love you, God. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. Amen. 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 Um, we've been, well, hey, who, who here has stepped out? I'm going to, well, let me start. Let me start this way. I know a lot of you have been asking about Rachel. So the, the surgery went really well. The surgeon was very excited about it like uh, yes thank you <laughs> typical recovery Rachel has her ups and her downs you know I mean you know but nothing unusual just just uh, everything's normal it's just been a couple days so she's still uh, obviously a little sore and whatever but um, can't tell you how much I mean they say today I didn't know in the bulletin it says today is pastor apparition Sunday 
And, and I promise you, if you touch me, I'm very real. You know, I, it's, it's, I'm not an apparition of myself. But, you know, I had to joke about it. But um, M Michelle, Michelle left for a couple weeks to visit her uh, family in Oklahoma. Or really, Kyle's family in Oklahoma. But it's like her family. They, 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 they love each other. So she was working hard on Tuesday to get everything done for us. And I think made a little typo there. But it is Pastor Appreciation Sunday. And I feel super appreciated. I absolutely do. I want you to know... That you mean the world to us, to me and Rachel, you, you really, I, I, I brag about you, you know, on Wednesdays we have our um, pastor's prayer time and pray with, eh, I say prayer, we pray, we're together for about two hours, we pray about 15 minutes. It's really, it's really us just being friends, loving each other, catching up on each other's lives, and um, I brag about you, I, I think I have like the best church like in the world. Like, really, the way you love Jesus, you love to worship. I mean, well, you listen to me speak. I mean, that says a lot. And, um, and, and beyond that, you know, like these last few months, obviously, has been a difficult time for us. Your support, your prayers, your encouraging words, your, you know, many of you sent notes. And I know not all of you are note writers, but some of you who are wrote, write, note writers still sent notes because you cared. And thank you, and your gifts, and just the way you've really, really, and, and just, you mean so much to us. Words can't really describe how much you mean to us, and how much we love you, and we know you love us, and it's really a beautiful thing. And so thank you. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you on Pastor Appreciation Day that I don't feel like today's any different from any other Sunday. Like I always feel so blessed and appreciated by each and every one of you. I mean, I feel like you appreciate me every, every week, every week. I hope you do. If you don't, you really fake it well. <laughs> it's like they, they say the key to being a good pastor, right, is, is sincerity. You know, you have lots of different things you have to have, but one of the keys of sincerity I remember going through Bible college, the, the professor there, much love for him, said, you got to be sincere. He said, if you can fake that, you've got it made. <laughs> but I don't think you fake your appreciation. I really feel it all the time, and I want to say thank you for that. Hey, um, we've been doing this off and on, uh, more on than off, because I love doing it. Who here stepped out this past week to... Um, share Jesus, or to love somebody, or to um, pray with somebody, or just to, like, hey, it was a step for you. Like, you, you overcame some kind of fear barrier, and you did something for the Lord this past week. Raise your hand. Yeah, look at that. Look at that. Like, guys, I love that you do this. Do any of you, with your hand raised, do you want to quickly share with us how that went? <laughs> Carrie, yeah, Carrie, come on. Yeah, all right, yeah, come on, Donna. All right, all right. And then, Craig, if you can cue up the video. You hate talking in it? All right, the key is hold it kind of close. If you don't, they have to turn you way up and get feedback. I know it's counterintuitive. You hear the feedback, you want to, no, no, get it closer. All right. Okay. No, that's them back there. Tom, can you fix that? Sorry. Um, there, I, we went to see some of the veterans. And, oh, yeah. Um, we were walking down, and I met this one woman on her day from Chatham, and she mentioned that they just had a veteran for leukemia because she has leukemia. Oh, wow. And, you know, it still didn't hit me at the time to stop and pray for her. So I said, you know, right now I am. I said, I'll come back uh, to buy something from her. And then when we were coming around some of the other booths, there was a booth where they were doing tarot card readings, which made me really mad. Yeah. <laughs> and I just prayed as I went by. And then there was um, another booth from um, the Church of Enlightenment, which is like a witchcraft church. And they were trying to get people to come in. 
so I prayed when I went by that, and then I went back to the booth to get the candle, and I'm like, God, I need to be praying for this woman here. You know, these people are out there not having any problem promoting what they want. So I asked her if I could pray for her, and she was so open to it. So I just stepped out and prayed for her healing and for God to bless her business. So that was that was a big thing for me. <laughs> but wow. God gets the glory. Amen. That, you know. And then just quickly the other night when I came to the Wednesday night Bible study, there were two young women out by the door, and I came in. And I don't know what they were here for, just kind of hanging around. And as I was coming in, one of the girls said, see, you know, life is so hard. And I thought, stop. So I went back out, and I said, you know, life is very hard, but that's why we have Jesus. And so I was talking to them a little bit. They're, I think they're kind of on a journey, you know, a little, little new age, whatever. And so I just shared with them about Jesus, that, you know, he is the Son of God. You know, they weren't quite there believing that, but, you know, I suggested um, uh, the book, A Case for Christ. Yeah. Ruth Vogel, you know, I said, if you're on your journey, just check it out. And I just, you know, prayed that God would bless them. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> woo <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Like, um, a lot of the nights here, a lot of you maybe don't know this, but we have NAAA, Al-Anon, Non-Anon, and they meet here many nights. So uh, if, if, if they weren't in our Bible study, they're probably there for that. And you could just share Jesus. That's so awesome. So very cool. So very, very cool. Love that. All right, who's next? Carrie, come on up. I love sharing these just because I want to be an encouragement to you. I am not always the most bold person out there. It takes time to step into it, and God starts to give you that boldness to step out. Um, two times at work this week, I had a gal, young gal, and she was telling me she had had a stroke. And I'm like, oh, well, I, I couldn't tell you had a stroke. And she, it's a birth defect. Anyway, at the end of, of her facial, I asked her, I said, I know this might sound a little weird to you, but c could I pray for you? Like, the Holy Spirit is just going to pray for her, pray for her, pray for her. And I'm like, I don't know if I can do it. And I said, well, you know, it's, it's weird, I know. So could, would you like me to pray for you? She looked up with big tears in her eyes, and she said, would you? And I just laid hands on her, and I started praying for healing in her brain for um, other things that she had going on. And then after the facial, when we stepped out, I said, just call me anytime if you need prayer. Call this one, I'll give you a call back. And she, that's when she told me she and her boyfriend had started praying together. So just, you know, always throwing a little water on that. And then mm -hmm. shortly, well, this was, yes, this was yesterday, was helping a lady and she had um, Bristol, Canine Police Department on her sweatshirt, oh, okay. and I said, "Hey, that, do you or your husband work for the police department?" And and she said, "Yes, yes, I I do, or, or my husband does." And I said, "Well, could I pray for you? Would that be okay?" And, and she's like, "Stop! I'm going to cry." Cause I'm sure some of you know that there had a, been an incident recently, right? Yeah. Please keep our officers and their families in prayer for what they go through all the time and never miss an opportunity to love on them and pray for them. Um, and I just told her, I said, I, I go to Bridge Community Church there in Bristol, and I said, I want you to know that our congregation loves you guys and we pray for you guys all the time. And she just broke down, and I just gave her a big hug. And that's, it wasn't anything I planned on that day, but others see that, too, and they're like, what's going on? What's the deal? They see Christ loving others through you. Step out. If it feels weird, so what? It's not about you. Just step out and have that testimony. Amen. Amen. That's awesome. You know, uh, just because she mentioned that with the police, Friday we, we rescheduled the trunk or treat till tomorrow night with the police department. So tomorrow from 4 to 7, the police are bringing a lot of their cruisers, their canine unit, and their crime lab, their SWAT mobile. They're gonna, and, and they're inviting us to bring our cars and decorate them. And last year, there was probably about 1,000 people who came. And one of the greatest ways 
it, it just blesses families here in the, in, the, in the community, but it also blesses our police. They're going to fill our parking lot with their, and they'll be here, and you can go and let them know, like Terry said, hey, we're praying for you. Thank you for the ways you're serving us. So that's tomorrow from 4 to 7. Bring your trunk. Decorate it, or even if you don't decorate it, bring a bunch of candy. I promise the kids won't care if it's not decorated, if you have candy. <laughs> that'll be good enough. But if you can decorate it, that'll even be better. And again, just a way of blessing, blessing our community and blessing our police and thanking them. And then also with our police on Thursday, we'll mark the one-year anniversary when um, um, Officer Hamsey and Sergeant Del Monte were shot and killed. And there'll be a special vigil right outside the police. They're going to shut down North Main Street, and there'll be a, just a prayer time. Um, and if you want to be there, we'll try to be there if you can. And, and it's not going to be a lot of hoopla. They're just going to have candles. They're going to be quiet, and people are going to pray or gather in groups and pray. And... Uh, just pray God's comfort, his blessing, his peace on those families, and his protection on the police force. Hey, great story. Great story. Carrie, way to go. Way to go. Notice how she just went for it. She just said, hey, I'm going to pray. That's not comfortable. I'm going to pray. All right. Lynn, come on up. Yep. Good morning. Um, this past week I was on vacation, but it was a working vacation. It was a dog certification down in Maryland. So on the way down, I had stopped in New York for lunch. And about an hour and a half later, I kept hearing Hardee's cheeseburger. Hardee's cheeseburger. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I'm not hungry. So a little ways down the road, lo and behold, there was a Hardee's restaurant so I pulled in and I still wasn't hungry I'm like God what am I doing here I don't want you know I'm not hungry I have a time limit here so I went in and I ordered a Hardy's cheeseburger and there was a person in front of me um, a gentleman and uh, the manager um, handed him his sack of food and at when he was leaving she said to him pray for my daughter and then I didn't see her after that. She went into the back and someone else waited on me to give me my cheeseburger. So I waited around a little while and I asked the, the people, and they, you know, where's your manager? And they said, oh, we don't know. And so I decided to go back out to the parking lot and I got in the, in the van and was ready to go. And I saw her walking around the building um, on her phone. So I waited till she was finished with her phone call and I went over to her and said, can I pray for your daughter? And she broke down in tears, collapsed on the ground, and was just so thankful that someone would even care that overheard the conversation to pray for her. So we prayed for her, and her daughter had, was in the hospital for two, two days. They thought it was a heart attack, um, but they couldn't figure out the cause because the tests weren't showing that it was a heart attack. So we prayed, I prayed for her family, I prayed for salvation for her family and her daughter and that and left. Um, and so on the way back, coming back home um, yesterday, I stopped in and found the manager again and she recognized me right away. And she said, oh, I gotta tell you, I've been trying to call you all week, but I had to turn my phone off. And she said, my daughter's better. She said, I talked to the doctors and right after we had talked, yeah. Um, when we were praying, when we were praying, they a, a doctor happened to walk by that knew what it was, and it was some kind of muscle spasm that started in her abdomen, went up her side, and into her chest. And so she walked out of the hospital hours later, Amen. which was awesome. And then <laughs> what was interesting is that she said, you know, she was crying again and praying. She says, you know, the gentleman that was in front of you um, that I asked to pray was an area pastor. And he didn't really give her the time of day to pray for. And she said, how can a complete stranger have more compassion for me and my family than someone that works for God? And that broke my heart. It broke my heart that we need to get out there as individuals and as pastors outside of our four walls. And that's what City Quake is going to do for us here. That's right. Amen. Amen. Hey, isn't that, you know, the idea of
Can God speak to you when he's saying, go get a Hardy's hamburger? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And this is the thing, like, sometimes we expect the Holy Spirit to somehow show up on Apparition Sunday. And, um, <laughs> and like, make it all, like, weird and magical. And sometimes it's just as simple as him saying, hey, you know what? Why don't you go to get some pizza and there's going to be somebody there. You know, I, I, you probably heard me say this before, but it's good re repeating. With the five kids, if I'm going past, you know, Aldi or Walmart, I'll text Rachel and say, hey, anything you want me to pick up, any errands I need to run, just to save the trip, you know. And she'll either send me a list or not. Can God, is it okay with you if God sends you on an errand once in a while? Like it? hey, I'm crossing Hardee's. God, is there anything I can do for you? Yeah, actually, go get a hamburger. Pray for the manager for her daughter. Can God do that with you? Right? Because maybe he wants to. Maybe he's just waiting for you to send him a text or a prayer saying, God, hey, here's a, here I'm at. Can I run an errand for you, God? And it's as easy as that. Hey, we have a video. Let's show it, and then we'll get into our message. Hey, there, Bridge Church. In Connecticut right now I'm just passing through going back to Texas today but listen November 8 through 11 City Quakes gonna be right there in your church I think that the bridge church could be a model for what this could be like in Connecticut meaning a church where 50 60 70 80 percent of the people are overflowing for Jesus every single day do you know the impact that this will have on the whole area New Britain and all the surrounding towns it will have a tremendous impact for Jesus. It's like mini revival as we go back and learn how to walk with the Holy Spirit. So would you do me a favor, take off work, clear your schedule, register now, and get there November 8th through 11. We're going to have a blast together. That's one of our speakers, and uh, like he said, do what you need to do. And there's brochures on the back, and... Uh, if money's in the way, let us know. We, we, we really uh, want to see everybody go if they can. All right. Very cool. Well, the power of God's love. We've already been hearing stories of the power of God's love. Three stories we just heard. The power of God's love. There's probably no more powerful force on earth than the love of God. And he wants us to access it and release it in the world around us. Let's dive in. We, we ended last week on 1 John 4, 16, and I want to pick up where we ended. So it goes, so we know and rely on the love God has for us. That's where we ended last week. God wants you to deepen your knowledge of his love, and that word know means experience. He wants you to have a greater experience of his love and he wants you to come to the point where you totally rely on it. Like, you take it for granted almost. You expect it to be there for you. Because it's always going to be there. His love never fails. It never runs out. It's always there for you. And he wants you to experience it so many times that you don't just know in your head that you can rely on his love, but you experience it. I said last week, just like when you sit down, you don't test the chair. You just sit down. You've sat down on so many chairs over and over and over and over again that you just rely on that it's going to be there for you. It's going to hold you. And that's how God wants you to treat his love. He wants you to rely on it. He wants you to depend on it. God is love. Isn't that interesting? God defines himself here as love. Now those of you who, who know me know that we preach the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation. We believe in all this. God's word is clear for the decisions already made. Like, we, we, we believe. And we know that God defines himself as many things. We have his names written around here. One of the things that God defines himself as is agape love. That's the word here when it says God is love. It's the Greek word, not Philadelphia, brotherly love. It's the Greek word agape. Sacrificial love. God is pure, total, sacrificial love. God can never be divorced from this attribute 
or he would stop being God. In other words, when God is holy, he's also love. And when he's love, he's also holy. When God is just, he's also love. And in his love, he's also just. He is always, always all of who he is. He's never, ever only part of who he is. Always God is love. His love is infused in truth and justice and holiness. And we talk about holiness and justice when we're on those verses. So I don't want you to think I'm overlooking that. But today we're on the verse that says God is love. And so we're going to talk about his love. God always loves you. He always completely loves you. Never is there a moment in your life where he does not love you. God is love. He goes on to say, whoever lives in love, whoop, we're not done that verse, whoever lives in love, I know, we're excited to get to the next verse, whoever lives in love, lives in God, and God in them. You need to protect your receiving of God's love and your releasing God's love. Because when you stop living in that love, you stop living in God. Satan wants nothing more than to attack the part of you that experiences God's love. Because if you stop experiencing his love, you'll stop distributing his love. Then we'll stop having stories like that, what we just heard. We'll stop, and the world won't see God for who he is. Remember the verses before, we talked about it last week, no one has seen God at any time. We're about to read a verse in a moment that says, as Jesus was, so are you in the world. See, Jesus came to reveal God to the world around you, and that's why God made you. And that's why you're here this morning, is to learn more, and so, uh, me too, of how do we learn more about showing the world who God is. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. I would say it's worth much more than that. People can talk about God till the day is done and the next day and the next week and the next year. The world around you is tired of hearing people talk about God. They want to see how God is. They want you to show God to them. And so Jesus did not come just to tell us about God. And he did not come to show us what he could do. He came to show us what we can do when we fully believe in him. And so it was clear that he, in a sense, limited, he was fully God, but he limited himself to the resources we have at our disposal. He said, when I speak, I speak the words God gives me to say. Right? When he's casting out demons, he said, if I, through the Spirit, cast out demons... He, he, he was letting us know. I mean, he could have cast out demons on his own authority, but he was very clear. He said, no, no, I'm casting them out by the Spirit because, see, that's how you and I have to do it. We have to rely on the Holy Spirit. And so he's making it very clear. He didn't come just to show us what he could do. Genesis is all about what he can do. He spoke the world into creation. Revelation is all about what he can do. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is showing us how we are to live, what we can do. We're to live like him, talk like him, be like him. And when we access his love and experience his love and live in that, then we release it and distribute it to the world around us. Now we'll know what it is to live in God. In other words, if you're not loving, you're not experiencing God, and then you begin thinking Christianity doesn't work. Because what you've done when you don't love is you've turned the New Testament and you do to it what the Pharisees did to the Old Testament. It didn't work for them, and it won't work for you. In other words, you make the New Testament a bunch of rules and a bunch of things, and then you take the relationship and you drive it out, and you say, well, this is what Jesus taught, and hey, I love the New Testament. I'm not, but it's not meant to be a book of rules. It's meant to be a book of life, of relationship. And as we walk in that relationship and we experience love, because without love, what relationship do you have? You'll have fear. We'll get to that in a minute. With love, we have relationship. And with that relationship, the New Testament becomes alive. And it lives. So Jesus didn't just teach us who we can be. He saves us so that we can be what he's teaching us we can be. 
that's why we sing amazing grace. Because his grace isn't just showing us. That would be a disaster. That would not be good news. Him just showing us or teaching us. Because then we would never have the power to do it if it was only that. And it would be frustrating. And we would feel like inadequate. And we would know that we can't be what he's teaching us to be. But he came to save us so that we can live the life he was teaching us to be. He empowers us. He transforms us. And it's a beautiful thing. So you have to protect your love. Protect the part of your life that receives God's love and releases it to the world around you. That's the thing Satan wants to attack the most. He wants you to feel like God does not love you. He wants you to believe that God is not good. That God somehow is holding back on your life. He wants you to not distribute God's love to the world around you. To hold back in fear. To hold back in, in a lot of different things we'll get to. Because when you stop accessing and releasing God's love, you'll stop experiencing God in your life. And then you become a fake. This is how love, next verse, now we'll get to it, Craig. This is how love is made complete among us. So that we have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. Last verse, protect your love. This verse is about completing your love. Complete the love so that you have confidence. There's no shortcut to confidence in the Christian walk. You can't fake it till you make it. You just can't. You are either living in the love of God and experiencing his love and releasing it in the world around you in power, or you're not. And you can say things and you can get all excited. You can get your voice really loud and declare things, but your prayers aren't being answered because you're not confident. And the way and the only way you're going to get confident in the Lord is through intimacy with Jesus. Intimacy leads to confidence. You've got to worship. You've got to pray. You've got to s connect with God every day. Doing the things like I said, hey God, do you have an errand you want me to run today? Because I'm all for it. It's out of intimacy that your confidence grows. And with that confidence comes the ability to take massive and extraordinary risks for God. You so rely on his love, you so build confidence through that love exchange that you're going to take major risks for the Lord. And that's the walk of faith, right? That's exciting. That is so exciting when you take those risks for God. That's how you spell faith, R-I-S-K. It's taking risks for the Lord. Sometimes I like this story because when I was five, I visited my grandparents and, uh, in, in, in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. My grandfather was the pastor of the Second Welch Church. Now, either that, there were so many Welch Christians in Wilkes-Barre that they had to have two churches, or the Welch people were so divisive that one split off. I don't know because I really was a little kid at the time. But anyways, we were visiting, loved that church, loved my grandfather. He lived in an apartment, and uh, in the apartment was a pool, and in the pool was a diving board. I had never seen a diving board before. And I remember this very clearly. My brother and my dad loved diving boards. So I'm in the shallow end, and they're in the deep end, diving, all, having a great time. And because they were having a great time, and I saw them enjoying it, because I love adrenaline, I always have, I still do, I wanted to try it out. I remember going out there onto the diving board, and as I walked out, I'm five, remember, I'm very little, I was terrified. My brother said, come on, do it, do it, do it. My knees started to shake. Like, I was scared. And I stepped back didn't do it. Well, well, they, they let me play in the shallow end, but they kept having a great time jumping off the diamond, doing tricks, doing flips, doing all kinds of stuff. And I wanted to try again. This time my dad got into the water and he said, come on, Todd, jump and I'll catch you. And I walked out, the same thing. I was just like so afraid. I just couldn't do it. I played a little bit. I kept watching them have fun. And I kept trying. Now, 
my dad was down there saying one of these times, jump. And I don't know if I finally jumped. I seem to remember I got a little push from my brother. <laughs> I do. I'm not sure. I'm not accusing him of that. I just think so. Anyway, I'm in the air. And I landed in the water. And my dad did catch me. I was fine. He put me up. And I'm like, and he said, do it again. Because he knew. He knew if you're going to really get it, you got to do it again. So I went up the round. I came over. And I jumped again. Not nearly as afraid. A little, but not. And he caught me. Do it again. Well, after a while, he maybe was sorry because I'm just like, again, Daddy, again, I'm not even looking. I'm not scared at all. I'm just running off that diving board. And what used to be terrifying became super fun and exciting for me. What Satan wants you to believe is that the things of God are terrifying. And what God wants you to know is the things that you're afraid of will become the thrill of your life. It will be the thrill of your life. And that he is in the bottom of the pool saying, jump, I'll catch you. Come on, just jump. You know what? Sometimes you need a brother in the Lord giving you a little push. Sometimes you need to hear the stories and see how they're jumping off the diving board, having a great time. And it creates this desire in you. And it's the voice of God saying, jump, jump, don't be afraid. Because if you'll just jump, you'll discover that the thing you're afraid of is the most fun you'll ever have in your life. And pretty soon, you'll be saying every day, again, Daddy, again, Daddy, I want to jump again. I want to do it again. I want to pray for that person again. I want to share your love again. I want to see a miracle again. I want to do these things for you. God will want to use you, every one of you. See, we think it's about us and how smart we are or how gifted we are or how well we can speak. It's never about you. It's always about what he can do through you. It's what he can do through you. It doesn't matter how gifted you are or smart or rich or educated or any of those things. Because he's the same through you as he is through me. It just doesn't matter how young you are or how old you are. He can do what he can do. And it's the same. He's powerful. You get this confidence, this faith, by living in his love. You can't conjure it up. You can't fake it. You can't just, it's going to be through living in it. There is no fear in love. Yeah, that's good. In this world, oh, there, let me finish reading. This is how love is made complete among us. So that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. There it is. In this world, we are like Jesus. We are like Jesus. That is the identity that God wants you to have. That you will be like Jesus. What would Jesus, how would he operate if he worked where you work? If he went to school where you go to school? If he lived in the neighborhood where you live? If he lived in the home that you live, how would Jesus be? That's how you're to be. And here's the good thing is his grace is going to be there for you. His grace is going to be there so that you can do it. All right, let's keep going. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Don't let Satan trick you into thinking God is waiting to punish you. Or hold back something good from your life. This is his trick as old as the Garden of Eden. Where he wanted to make Adam and Eve believe that God's not really good. But he's keeping something really special away from them. And he loves this trick. We saying your goodness is running after me. It is because he loves you. There's no fear in love. Perfect love drives out fear. God loves you perfectly. God loves you perfectly. Say that over yourself for a moment. Just say, God loves me perfectly. Here we go. God loves me perfectly. Say it one more time. God loves me perfectly. He does. He absolutely does. He wants you to have the greater blessing. He wants you. He wants, like, 
I have five kids. If I had it, and I don't, but if I had it, I would give each one of them a million dollars. Right? If I had it, I'd give each one of them a brand new car. Right? If I had it, I'd give each one, if I could, the best education possible, the growing up in church, loving God. I want them to have the best I can offer them. In fact, I want them to have more than what I can offer them because they're my kids and I love them. You are the child of God. He wants you to have the best blessings he could possibly give. He wants that for you. He does. There's never a moment he does not want that for you. He wants it for you. Why do I not always give my teenagers, though, the keys to the car? See, God cares more about your character than he does your comfort because when your character grows, he can trust you more. And when he trusts you more, he can give you those greater blessings. See, the greatest blessings of God are incredibly powerful, and they can be destructive or they can be used for good. God needs to trust you that you'll use his blessings for good. That his blessings won't drive you from him. Take the blessing of money, which is not one of the greater blessings. It actually is not. Jesus makes it clear, right? If you can't be, you know, Jesus talks about faithful little, faithful and much. He says, if you can't be faithful with filthy lucre, how will you be trusted with the greater blessings of the Lord, with the greater riches of God? So it's not. But let's take money. How many people, if God gave them a million dollars or $10 million, that money would drive them away from God? How many? Now, the question is, would you be one of them? It's, the, it's an easy thing for God to give you that money. But why would he if it would make you less dependent on him? Why would he do that? It's just, just as a case in point, right? What about the other blessings of God? Like, God wants you to have them, but can you handle them? And so this, again, is why God cares more about your character than your comfort. And so, if necessary, he'll trade your comfort for your character. I do this every day. I wake up my kids to start them in school. Like, they're not comfortable getting out of bed at when I wake them up, but I do it because I care more about their character than their comfort. Well, God doesn't treat us any different because that's what love looks like. He loves you enough to want you to grow. He does. Because as you grow, he'll bless you more. When he can trust you with the keys, he'll give you the keys. Right? I love that, you know boy who, uh, teenager, hair was growing and, you know, he was just kind of not really, not really disciplined. And he goes to his dad and he says, dad, I'd like to have a conversation with you sometime about, you know, having access to the family car. And, uh, the dad said, well, that's okay. Sometime, you know, when we're, when you're ready for that conversation, I would like to talk to you about cutting your hair and making your bed and things like that. And the boy says, well, Dad, you know, I have thought about that. And you always told me to be like Jesus, and Jesus had long hair. <laughs> the dad said, well, that's a great point you're making, son. At the same time, Jesus walked everywhere he went. <laughs> All right. God loves you perfectly. He wants you to have the greater blessings. One of the things that he wants you to know is that you are always safe in his presence. You are always safe, completely safe in the presence of God. See, you rely so much on his love, you're safe. And because you are completely safe, again, you make extraordinary risks for God and for the kingdom. Because you know you're safe. He's in the pool saying, I'll catch you. You can't drown. He's going to be there for you. And because you know you're safe and you can fully rely on the love of God because you've experienced it, not just because you've had it in your head, through intimacy, you've known God in this way. And so what God doesn't want you to do is to rely on his promises. Whoa, did I just say that? Yeah. 
He does not want you to rely on his promises. He makes you promises so that you can learn who he is and you rely on him. My dad wasn't wanting me so much to rely on the promise of his catching me. He wanted me to go through the air and experience him catching me. Right? So Jesus doesn't just give you what you need. I say this a lot because it's so important. He becomes what you need. And he gives you a deeper relationship with himself. He becomes your peace when you feel anxious. And invites you to experience him as your peace. He doesn't want to just give you peace. He wants to give you a deeper relationship with himself. When you're feeling down, he becomes your joy. And invites you to experience his joy and the joy of knowing him. And so you take great risks for the Lord. You step through your fear barriers to do great things for God. All right, because fear has punishment, this is our last verse. Because fear has to do with punishment, the one who fears is not made perfect in love. Because fear has to do with punishment. I believe for every one of us, God wants us to go on a very deep journey of discovering why there's fear in our life. In the Bible, 12 of the greatest people who ever lived were the disciples of Jesus. And several times, more than any other question, Jesus asked them, why is it you have fear? Why are you afraid? Why are you afraid? Now, if some of the most bold and courageous people in the Bible and in the whole history of the world needed to be asked this question of why they were so afraid, do not think you do not struggle with fear. You do. We do. We all do. And Jesus wants us to discover the root causes of our fear so they can be eradicated out of our life so that we will do the things that he's destined us to do. Everything you want to do for all of eternity is on the other side of fear. Everything. And if you don't get over those fears, you're going to live in a way that is deprived and depleted of the things that God is good. See, Satan wants you to leave God's holding out on you. Really, he's putting fear barriers in your life to keep you from having an eternal impact for the Lord. That's what he's doing. Now, three things you need to know that helps with fear. And they're, they're found, God has not given us a spirit of fear, right? But of love, of power, and a sound mind. All right. Here's the three things you need to know about God. There's those three things. One, God loves you. Because he loves you, he wants what's best for you. So important you know that. He loves you. He wants what's best. This is why love drives out fear. But two, the sound mind, wisdom. God is wise. He doesn't just want what's best for you. He knows what's best for you. Right? Every politician I ever talk to say they want what's best for me. I, I have my doubts that they know what's best for me. All right? But God both wants and knows what's best because he loves you and he's wise. But he's also powerful, right? Love, spirit of love, of sound mind, of power. He can do what's best for you, and he is. He is always doing what's best for his children. He is always doing what's best for you. Even when it doesn't make sense, he's always doing what's best for you. You need to know those three things about God or you're going to live in fear. Because you can't control all the aspects of your life. And when you try to control, you're going to do things that will mess up your life. You cannot control it. And so you've got to trust the one who does control it, who is God. And that he loves you and he knows what's best and he's doing what's best. You know, why don't we share Jesus or pray with people or oh, every time people it's like well I'm afraid see the things God wants the blessings he wants for you come on the other side of fear so this deep journey to discover and eradicate fear in your life and we call it different things like but self-protection self-protection is a form of fear when you put up things in your life to protect yourself from pain, listen, none of us love pain, but it's when we put up barriers to protect ourselves from pain that becomes the problem. We put up walls. I often talk about, you know, if this 
This was in the oven. If there was a casserole dish, it was in the oven. And I open the door and I grab it out. And ow, it burns. It's hot. I drop it. Don't worry, Tom, I'm not dropping it. But what do I do to get it out of the oven? I put on a hot mitt. The hot mitt insulates my hand so I can touch hot things and they not burn me. And when we go through life, what happens is from the time you're a little child, you realize that people burn you. Certain people burn you. Certain things, when you expose them, when you open them up, it hurts because people burn you. And what you do then is you put a hot mitt over your heart to protect your heart from the pain of other people hurting you. That's called self-protection. And it makes a lot of sense. Except, what, how is life really when you live life with a hot mitt over your heart? I'll tell you, when I have a hot mitt on my hands, I can't play the piano anymore. Some of the things that bring me the greatest joy and the greatest pleasure I can't do when I have hot mitts on my hands. When you have a hot mitt on your heart, you've really stopped living. You've really stopped loving. You see, the hot mitt not only protects you from pain, it prevents you from love. It prevents you from receiving love and giving love. See, the key to taking off the hot mitt is becoming vulnerable with other people. Exposing who you really are, your fears, your dreams, your heart with other people. But the minute you expose them, you give them power to hurt you. And so the hot mitt keeps you from being vulnerable, and it keeps you from that pain, but it means that you can no longer give love or receive love. Because at the back of your mind, you're going to know that person who says they love me, they don't really know me. Because I have this hot mitt. And if they don't really know me, how do I know they really love me? What if they really knew me? Maybe then they would reject me. And because we have such a huge fear of rejection, we self-protect. And we're not made perfect in love. And when we're not made perfect in love, we don't connect with God, right? And so when we don't connect with God, God begins to feel so distant to us. We can't have intimacy anymore. Now we don't have confidence. We don't have faith. We don't take risks for God. And we begin to feel like Christianity is just kind of, uh, we're not excited about it. We're not sharing it with our neighbors. It's not like it's the best thing that ever happened to us. Because it's not. In fact, at some point, it even becomes a burden to us to try to measure up, to live with all these standards and, and ideas and ideals that we can never really fully realize. And at some point, we either give it up or we just go through the motions, but neither one is very satisfying. And it all comes down to not being made perfect in love. Not willing to take that first risk of saying, I'm going to remove the hot mitt from my heart, and God, I'll let you talk to me. God, here's who I am. And let me share this with a few other people. And let me get used to sharing it with everybody. Some people maybe will hurt me, but other people will love me. And... When I'm hurting and when I'm loved, somehow holding those two things together. There's an old song by Isaac Watts. 200 years ago, he wrote, Sorrow and love flow mingled down. In the song, When I Survey the Wondrous Cloud. It's like somehow there's this pain and this love. And this is how Jesus lived. If we can have our worship team come forward. You know, when we're afraid of pain, afraid of rejection, afraid of failure, we begin to ask ourselves, will so-and-so like me? Will they reject me? Some cues that you're not being made perfect in love, well, the biggest one is anger. Glaring eyes, a, you know, a, a, the, the, the clenched teeth, cutting words, all these signs of anger. You can never show anger and feel love for that person, or they won't feel it as love, I promise you. See, the implications that if there's no fear in love is that not only do you receive perfect love from God, but you give perfect love away. That you become predictably safe and constant. The implications that as a church, we've developed this culture, the safest place to be should be this church. No fear of condemnation, shame, embarrassment. 
because fear is not a part of love. Some cues that we're living in fear is anger, wanting to control, wanting to punish other people, wanting to make them, punish them emotionally if they cross a line to hurt us. As soon as they cross that line, we make them pay in different ways so they will never cross the line again. Sometimes another cue is doubt. We live in doubt. We question things. We're not going for it. We're, we're, we're confused by a lot of things. We feel ourselves inadequate and unable to do the things for God because somehow we think we have to rely on ourselves instead of on Him. We get overwhelmed. We don't want to start. We don't begin. We begin to feel depressed. These are all signs that we're living in fear. And so we need to become the safest, most predictable people on earth. A culture of safety. A culture of perfect love. That the world around us can know and rely. Our families can know and rely on our love. Our neighbors can know and rely on our love. Everyone around will know and rely on our love. Because that's how God loves us. Now to be able to give it, we have to receive it. Freely you have received, freely give. To know that God loves you perfectly, you are safe in his presence. You can rely on his love. And to build intimacy every day, you have to access it to release it. And I just believe right now there's an invitation from God to access his love for you. And I want us to just move into that. Can we bow in prayer? God does not want us to be a slave of fear, but to know that we are the much-loved child of God. The much-loved child of God. That his love is greater than fear. That you don't live in self-protection, that you don't hold back, but you know like he's in the pool saying, come on and jump. Discover how exciting life can be when you know I'm always here to catch you. And you start doing great things for Jesus. God wants you to have the greatest blessings. He doesn't want you to have the minor ones. He wants you to have the great ones. Because you're the daughter he loves so much. You're the son he loves so much. He wants to bless your life. Just receive, open your heart, take off the hot mitt. Start telling him the things. I love that verse with Abraham when he's about to sacrifice Isaac. God stops him, of course. That's where we get the name Jehovah Jireh, that God who provides. But he says to Abraham, now I know that you love me more than your only son. How is it that now God knew? Now I know, God says. Didn't God know before? Yes, he could have known, but only if he invaded Abraham's life. Here's the thing. There's certain things God can know about you, but he chooses not to know unless you reveal it to him in prayer. Can you just take a moment and start revealing your heart to God right now? Start revealing your heart to Jesus. Tell him your hopes, your dreams, your fears. Tell him your mistakes. You won't know his love until you start doing that. And learn to do it every day. Tell him who you are. Jesus said that in the end days, many will come saying, Lord, Lord. So they're calling Jesus Lord. Haven't we cast out demons in your name and prophesied in your name and done wonderful works in your name? I mean, listen, they're casting out demons. They're doing miracles. And they're, they're doing good things. And they're prof prophetic. And they're all doing it in the name of Jesus. But I will say to them, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, because I never knew you. How is it possible God didn't know them? Again, 
There's certain things, God, God can know everything, but there's certain things he doesn't let himself know about your heart unless you share it with him because he wants intimacy with you. Share your heart with Jesus. There's no safer place for your heart to rest than in the presence of Jesus. He wants you to know and rely on his love for you. He wants you to access his love as the much-loved child and daughter and son of God. And then you'll just start overflowing with it. You'll start giving it away. You'll become confident. You'll become excited. And everything will begin to make sense. And you'll never go back. Your life will be transformed. Tell God that you give him permission to take you on a journey to explore fear in your life and to eradicate it. Tell him that you want that. I don't believe Jesus was asking a redundant question when he asked his disciples, why are you so afraid? I think he was inviting them to have a conversation with him about their fear. And he was starting the conversation by saying, why are you afraid? He wanted them to answer the question. And he wants you and I to answer the question, why are we afraid? Why do we hold back? Why do we not pray? Why do we not share our faith? Why don't we take extraordinary risks for God? Why are we afraid? He wants you to answer those questions. So that he can show you that he is reliable and dependable, that he is safe and you can trust his love. Dear Jesus, we thank you for your love. We open our hearts to receive it. I ask God for courage and grace for each person here to make a step to be vulnerable with you and at least one other person. to know your love and to take great risk for you, God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's, let's stand and let's sing this wonderful song. Deliverance from my enemy.
Father, we love you. Thank you that we are not slaves to fear, that we are children of God, that we are the much-loved son of God, the much-loved daughter of God, that you want to give us the greatest blessings, and that you are working in our lives for our good, always for our good, that we are always completely loved by you, and that we are safe in your presence. God, give us courage and grace to walk in this love to count and rely on this love, to be confident in this love, to take extraordinary risks for you and for your kingdom, to build a story and have an impact that will last for all of eternity. God, I know that what you want to do in Bristol in the next few months will echo for eternity. And I praise you for it, God. I pray you use each and every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen.